Once again, I'm Sam Rowland, and my project is in collaboration with the Upper Gunnison Basin Riparian Restoration Resilience Project, which I will not say the whole title again, it's entire presentation, but um, I'm assessing the impacts of riparian restoration on arthropod abundance and diversity. So this project, which has a massive amount of stakeholders, um, seeks to enhance habitat resiliency in order to adapt to a changing climate. And um, one of the reasons why they're doing this is because most in sage grouse um, rely on this riparian habitat for their brood rearing areas. Um, this habitat has been under threat from development, climate change, fragmentation, and improper grazing from the, for the last like, 100 years. Um, and so they consulted with Z Dyke Ecological Consulting, as in Bill Z Dyke. And he engineered these rock structures, as you can see here. Um, in order to slow the flow of water and restore these ecosystems. Um, and the results of these rock structures is actually quite dramatic. This is after one year. It's kind of awesome. Um, clearly, like, significantly revegetated. Um, so, to, uh, my project focuses on the treatment effect of installing these structures. So, a treated area, for all intents and purposes, is one that has structures installed. Uh, an untreated area, no structures installed. So to go through this, um, an area that's untreated, a lot of these areas look like this. Um, they're dry, ephemeral channels, they're incised, so they have steep banks on either side. And when water does flow through them, it flows through very quickly, it erodes. Um, it leads to limited vegetation and diversity, bare ground, and ultimately limited insect abundance, limited shading, and not the best habitat. But once you install these structures, they retain sediment, they retain water, um, the areas stay wetter a lot longer, and they also spread the floodplain. Um, this leads to a proliferation of diverse vegetation, increased habitat heterogeneity, and then increased vegetative shading, which has been shown to show to lead to an increase in vegetative and insect abundance and diversity. And this leads to a habitat that is more suitable for something like the gunnison and sage grouse. So gunnison and sage grouse, I'm sure everyone's heard a lot about them here. Um, they're an important species to this valley. Some would argue that they're almost like a symbol of the Gunnison Valley. But for the six, first 60 days of the Gunnison sage grouse's life, they rely on arthropod <coughs> abundance and availability in order to survive to the juvenile stage. So this is what they eat. They'll literally eat anything that moves. It doesn't have a defense mechanism. But they rely on arthropod abundance. And just to clarify, when I'm talking about arthropods for this study, it's insects, six legs, spiders, eight legs, and we have no crabs here. So <laughs> my monitoring project in particular is looking at the abundance and diversity of arthropods in treated, so places with structures, versus untreated sites. And this is looking at more of a bottom-up trophic indicator of restoration success. Um, and the project in general uh, looks at um, demonstrating collaborative efforts on a local level. So arthropods and riparian restoration, usually when you're looking at something like a sage step habitat and restoration, arthropod assemblages are very poorly described. Um, most people don't focus on bugs, I don't know why. Um, but <laughs> they usually focus on big pretty things like birds or animals or vegetative monitoring and that's kind of more of a large top-down kind of approach. Um, whereas insects, and arthropods, insects and spiders in particular, um, they tend to respond to the emergent properties of diverse plant communities. Um, they also tend to uh, respond to small micro habitats that you might find in a very diverse vegetative structure um, and patch dynamics. So I would argue for my study that if we're only looking at these large scale like animals and plants, we're failing to really understand the full um, picture of ecosystem health, especially in these stream bed communities. So there are several studies that have come out very recently, actually, that have been starting to look at this. And this study that was done in a Midwestern river, um, they installed these rock structures down a stream bed, um, and they found that the rock structures actually increased kind of translation between the aquatic habitat and the terrestrial habitat and it led to increasing the insect abundance at the installation sites, um, which uh, also increased insect 
species richness. And the reason why they think that this happened was because the weirs, so the rock structures that they used, which are different from ours, um, increased terrestrial habitat heterogeneity, and they provided these like small micro habitats. Um, another study that was done in 2003 looked at epidial, so ground dwelling insects, um, in response to artificial flooding. And uh, these families in particular actually uh, were in my study, which is cool, um, and they respond to riparian restoration at different capacities. Um, in particular, they looked at ground beetles, also known as carabid beetles, and they found that there are significantly higher abundance of carabid beetles even across seasons at flooding sites versus non-flooding sites. So this gray right here is at flood sites and that's non-flooding sites. There was also a study that was done last year um, in China in an arid ecosystem that showed that uh, in an arid ecosystem, arthropods prefer, arthropods prefer these like densely vegetative patches. They serve as like fertile hotspots, which are like a biological hub of nutrients in an otherwise pretty desolate landscape. And when water is scarce and the plants are water stressed, they're more likely to survive as a population if they have these patches that are both like very numerous and close together. So for my study, I originally had a lot more sites than this, but we're gonna look at these sites in particular. I had two treated sites. Upper and Lower Sagehen Gulch, um, which is the untreated site, and that's right here. Uh, those were untreated, but they actually will have structures installed in 2016, which is exciting. And then I had Upper and Lower Chance Gulch, which had structures installed in 2014, and I did my monitoring a year ago, so it was after one year. Um, I did this by using these beautiful wet pitfall traps, which are essentially uh, deli containers that I put in the ground. Um, and I fill these deli containers with propylene glycol in order to preserve insects as they walk along and they fall into their deaths. And <laughs> I covered it with a plate, which kept rain out. It didn't keep everything out, but it kept a good amount of water out of my traps. Um, experimental design. So I had 20 traps that were installed per site. I had four sites. Um, and they were installed at random intervals along these riparian corridors. So just to reiterate, the corridors are about a thousand feet and I had to pace them out. Um, and so upper chance is treated, lower sedge hen is untreated. So another bit of experimental design, I was trying to test for differences in vegetation. So I placed these traps in the ground to represent these different vegetation types. Um, so if this, this is actually one of the riparian corridors that I tested, but if I was to install traps here, that would be lowland sage, willow, carex rush, and mixed graminoid. So the results, <laughs> this took so long. Um, this took a lot of hours. After all was said and done, I emptied out every single trap and sorted out every insect and identified every insect family. Uh, I just looked this up actually. I identified 8,342 insects. Um, so I feel like I know a lot now. Um, <laughs> and I just have the help of an intern, but I did most of that by myself. Um, so the results using a non-parametric ANOVA were that there was significantly higher abundance of insects in the treated sites with the structures than in the areas without the structures. I also found that functional groups were different. Um, beetles and spiders in particular had significantly higher numbers in areas with treatment versus areas without treatment. Whereas ants didn't seem to care where they put their anthill, which is an interesting thing to know. Um, grasshoppers and wasps also were in higher abundance. And the family Carabidae, which is brown beetles, was also in higher numbers. And if you remember from that previous study, brown beetles have been proposed to be used as flood indicators. However, we did not find a difference in the Crystal Wallace test um, in diversity between treated and untreated sites. Uh, just to reiterate, higher abundance in treated versus untreated, but we didn't see a difference in diversity, <coughs> richness, or evenness between the sites. Also, beetles, once again, beetles and spiders had a very large increase in response to treatment. We also found that in terms of vegetation, uh, willows and more like wet, shady habitats seem to hold a lot more arthropods. 
than dry places like bunchgrass, lowland sage, upland sage, and that kind of coincides with that study done last year talking about patch dynamics. So <laughs> we did this very complicated study um, called non-metric multidimensional scaling of functional groups, or well, mine was of functional groups, and by functional groups I mean like beetles, spiders, wasps, etc. And this stu this study um, or treat or this analysis in particular uh, tests different uh, individual plots or uh, samples against each other and in relation to a multitude of variables. Um, a lot of the variables I used were things like um, if it's close to a structure or further away, like exactly how close is it, uh, slope, aspect, treatment, vegetation, all that kind of stuff. And this showed that there was a difference between, there was a difference between areas with treated versus untreated and species richness. So species richness was increasing um, as areas were treated. We also found when I looked at just individual families, basically the same thing. So richness would increase as you got closer to structures. So the implications of this, they found in recent studies that riparian restoration increases these niches and little novel habitats which also increases the species pool. So um, we also found that abundance of individual functional groups, particularly beetles and spiders, um, this was very interesting. Uh, so beetles and spiders were more abundant, as you can see right here. These large blue triangles show that in these treated sites, which is blue triangles, beetles were more abundant. And so there definitely is some sort of difference or relationship there. And I'm wondering if these could be treatment indicators specifically. So if these arthropods are indicators of ecosystem health, could they be reintegrated into planning and monitoring? So like I said, I spent <laughs> so many hours identifying these insects and spiders to family, and it took a lot of time and a lot of resources, um, and I'm wondering if we could kind of make the process a little bit faster and streamline it by just looking at beetles and spiders, because literally anyone could just look at beetles and spiders. It's pretty easy. Um, so why is my project important? Sage step ecosystems are severely degraded in the west, and particularly in this area um, of the west in the Colorado Western Slope. Uh, Gunnus and sage grouse rely on this ecosystem resource, and they also rely on arthropods for survival. And climate change does threaten to alter the dynamics of this through increased drought and flooding. And you can imagine if you have a drought or a flood and there's a wetland there, it buffers the extreme effects of those events. So in adapting to a, a changing climate, this restoration project aims to enhance the adaptability and resilience of these areas. Um, and by studying arthropod assemblages as indicators of restoration success, we're gaining insight into what it means to be a fully functioning habitat. And um, one important thing to mention too is the sage grouse are not the only things that rely on the arthropods for their survival. Um, I found voles, mice, salamanders, all sorts of animals out there. There's definitely a lot of life out there um, that would depend on arthropods for their survival. Um, as far as the future for the project, I would like to see how these re results would change over multiple seasons. A lot of studies have shown that seasonality actually can trump the effect of um, just uh, treatment versus not treatment in some cases, just because spring is a lot wetter than fall. Um, and I'm also wondering how it would change over multiple years. Some of the studies I looked at showed that there wasn't a difference in diversity, richness, or evenness between sites until year five, 10, or 15 after treatment. And I only looked at year one. Um, the structures that are to be built at Sage Hen Gulch have a unique opportunity for study because I looked at baseline data, I looked at the area before it has structures. So I'm wondering if we could look at it after it has structures, like after one year, and after five years, after ten years, and see what kind of real differences it makes. And once again, I'm wondering, can we use beetles and spiders as indicators of project success? And right before we go to questions, I just want to say a big thank you to Tom Grant. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the field driving around and pulling ticks off our shoes. Um, <laughs> uh, I also want to thank Betsy Neely, who couldn't make it today, and Andrew Braybart. They were huge. I would almost argue that they're both my community sponsors. 
Um, I'd like to thank all of my support group, including my mom and all my friends who thought it was cool to go out and collect bugs and help me sort them, <laughs> as gross as it was. Um, and I would like to thank the MEM program because without you guys, I would have thought it was possible to create an entire study by myself. structures and they're all sorts of shapes and sizes and generally um, when you have a restoration project the structures are very expensive and they use this like very general shape and he was able to engineer these smaller more specific shapes that you could put in a riparian corridor that like hold water push it kind of like alter the floodplain and so that's the treatment that we're looking at and it was installed by um, a lot of volunteers uh, I'm guessing there's a lot of you guys that have helped <laughs> lift rocks and put them places like Freddie Flintstone. Um, and yeah, if you want to help, I think it's like WFR or something, the wilderness group that's doing it. Um, they're always looking for volunteers. I get a lot of emails from them. So. <laughs> well, uh, the group's called Wildland Restoration Volunteers out of Boulder, but they help organize the project here. It's usually that first week in September. Thanks, Tom. Any other questions? So the, the increasing insect abundance is important for kind of some sage grouse. Are there other factors in plant diversity or changes in plant communities or any other advantages to sage grouse beyond the food source? Uh, so are you asking if uh, arthropods have any advantages or the structures themselves? If the structures themselves lead to advantages for sage grouse beyond, oh, okay. new, beyond the environment. Actually, so before I came along, the primary uh, advantage of having these structures was deemed to be kind of like having a wet habitat for their brood rearing, um, which they look for. They look for a wet, like primarily wet habitat with like large vegetation um, to protect them. And uh, yeah, they're very specific as to where they'll brood. So yeah, originally they were just focusing, like I said, on vegetation and birds, and I proposed to say, maybe focus on arthropods and <coughs> let me see what would happen if they did. So there's always some debate whether projects like that are effective across time and the massive amount of people power it has to go into putting them up. Do you see any downside to continuing for the basin after uh, two years of dedicating a bit of your life to them? Um, I don't know. I, like, I think it could be a really good continuing master's project. Um, I don't know what would be my downside, but... Are the, <laughs> the projects take time and money and resources? Oh. Do you think they're an effective use of the community <coughs> time, money, and resources? I do think they are, because I feel like without it, you're not seeing the full picture. And you couldn't see like the small changes in success of those riparian restoration structures, and instead you'd be focusing on larger things, which might not represent like the actual success. So like every structure that's installed, not every structure has this like lush plant community around it, but what if it actually does increase insect abundance? Um, and I've been in contact with Bilzy Dyke, and he's very excited about these results. So that was cool. I have two questions from Philip Wiki. Um, the first is how <laughs> difficult was it to keep your data organized? And the second is how long did it take to, for you to develop a standardized method um, <laughs> uh, let's see. It was really hard. I'll just put it that way. Um, in order to develop like a standard method, I basically did most of the work by myself with like a little bit of help. Um, I'm thinking he means, I don't know if he means by trap placement and the actual field work. I think he right? does mean like your system for how you were going to collect data. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so I had like a random numbers generator on my phone. I had talked about the experimental design with Tom, who is an expert, um, and Dr. Koop and Dr. Kevin Alexander. And I had to I had to talk to a lot of people 
to figure out what the best strategy was. It took a lot of time. I even put a little like blurb in on Ecolog, which is like a listserv, to see like who's collected bugs and what should I use. Um, but as long as far as streamlining, like it was kind of it was hard. So I had like a riparian corridor. I had to walk exactly like it was exactly 500 paces, and I had to stop at every random number and establish four points. And yeah, I'm sure there's some flaws in it, like every study, but um, it took a lot of took a lot of effort to plan. So. And then in terms of data organization, how did you end up? Philip wanted to know how you ended up structured and how you collect your data and what system did you use? Um, well, I used Excel. <laughs> and I literally put like every bit of information possible um, in Excel. So my processing sheets, like they have so many columns on them and obviously I didn't use all of those columns. Um, but that's how I used, or that's how I organized the data. It's like I had to go systematically, like every trap, pull it out write down every inf bit of information from that trap so I don't forget, um, make sure that like everything's correct as to like where it is, the slope, the aspect, and everything that I got in the field, mm -hmm. along with the UTMs, and um, yeah, and then go through and count everything using your ice cream cube tray, so thank you for that. <laughs> we uh, don't want them back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of like double checking and maybe going slower than I wanted to. So. Cool, thank you so much.